Thank you, Anna. So, to help us understand exactly what's happening in Ukraine, I'm joined now by our defence and security analyst, Michael Clark. Good afternoon to you, Michael. Um, first off, looking at this map here, um, has Russia made any advances? Uh, non uh, really since last week on the map, but as the Ministry of Defence said this morning, uh, Russia seems to be now going in for a strategy of, of attrition, which means they're bringing more troops in from lots of different areas, they're bringing more artillery in, so they're going to grind it out, which means more bombardments and, sadly, uh, probably a lot more civilian deaths. In Kiev in particular, <clears throat> they are trying to bring their artillery uh, into range of the city. They haven't surrounded the city as quickly as we thought, but when they get their howitzers within 15-mile range, then they can threaten to bombard the city almost at will with old-fashioned artillery shells. OK, now, really important to Russia, in the south, if we look at the map um, there, uh, uh, Mikolaev, the city of Mikolaev, and also Mariupol. Tell me what's happening there and why also they're so important. Yeah, Mikolaev is the gateway to Odessa, which is the main strategic uh, objective uh, in that part of the, of the country. And uh, at Mikolaev, the Russians are, are unable to actually secure the city. They've, they've been repulsed several times. The Ukrainians are counterattacking quite effectively and they've even pushed them back. And as you've indicated there on the icon, they seem uh, for a while at least to have got in behind them. If they have, that will be extremely interesting. So Mikolaev is, is, is a really tough nut for the Russians to crack and they seem to be doing worse rather than better over the last two or three days. And Mariupol has been bombarded, hasn't it, for, for weeks now. Uh, tell me what the latest is there. 80% of the housing stock has gone, either destroyed or, uh, or damaged, and the siege of Mariupol goes on. They're still fighting in the city centre, <laughs> which means that the, the, the city hasn't completely fallen, but it looks as if it's probably close to falling. And, of course, lots of people still in that theatre there who need to be saved. Indeed. Um, looking again at the wide map of the whole of Ukraine, um, Russia haven't made the progress that they want. How likely is it, do you think, there'll be some kind of pincer motion? Well, logically, they have to do a couple of things. They have to try and unite their southern and their northern forces. They've got to drive down to the south or up from the north Somewhere around Poltava, one would guess, the ancient city of Poltava, they will try to meet up and they will try to encircle the Ukrainian forces who are fighting so hard in the east of the country, particularly down here in the southeast. The Ukrainians have therefore got to decide at some point whether to uh, withdraw westwards to live to fight another day and probably to be available for the defence of Kiev. But if they do that, then they've got to give up a lot of the defence of these, these areas that they've been so ferocious about for the first three weeks. That's a difficult problem for them. On the other hand, the Russians are making pretty hard work of this sort of link-up, but logically, that's what they've got to try to do. OK, and briefly, um, we've heard a lot, haven't we, about this hypersonic missile in the West that's been deployed. Tell me about that. Yeah, the Kinzhal missile, Dagger in, in English, uh, there it is on a MiG-31. It can be delivered just by an interceptor aircraft. No defence against it. It's a new threshold. These weapons were developed for the apocalyptic idea of war between the superpowers, not war between a, a smaller country in Eastern Europe. So it's, it's another threshold crossed, I'm afraid. OK, so finally, looking back at that whole map of Ukraine. Um, not a lot changing, but actually very much a case of watch this space. Absolutely.